We are very happy to have six panelists tonight with us uh, from Hong Kong, Denmark, and Norway across three different time zones. First of all, we have Ted Hui, exiled former lawmaker from Hong Kong. Yip Mo Wong, Hong Kong activist and former vice convener of Civil Human Rights Front in Hong Kong. Joey Siu, human rights activist, associate of Hong Kong Watch, advisor to Interparliamentary Alliance on China, IPAC. We have Thomas Uroten, chairman of China Criticism Society of Denmark. We have Trina Scheigrande, chair of board of Peace Research Institute in Oslo, and also the Norwegian parliament member and former leader of Liberal Party of Norway. We have Petter Eide, Norwegian Parliament member of the Socialist Left Party. And we are very honored to have Christopher in the back, international news reporter from Aftenposten in Norway, uh, to be tonight's moderator. And if time is allowed, we'll have about five to 10 minutes Q&A session. So please post your questions here on YouTube. And just let's start, and um, Christopher, please. Thank you very much, Jessica, and uh, the honor is 100% uh, mine. Um, what a distinguished panel and uh, uh, with so much collective knowledge and uh, understanding of the current situation in, in Hong Kong. Um, so I'm very happy to be here, very happy to be moderating this. I figured we would start with just a basic introduction to, uh, to the situation today uh, where we can sort of get to meet everyone on the panel first. Uh, if we look at Hong Kong, um, I mean, two years ago, nobody knew that there was going to be this massive um, uh, show of de of democracy and uh, and uh, an engagement for for civil rights on the streets of Hong Kong. And if we look a year back to to February in 2020, nobody could have envisioned how quickly it would all go haywire the way it did later that that year. Um, I. I was in Hong Kong quite a lot myself in 2019, and not at all in 2020 for for obvious reasons. Uh, but and that I've been following closely from here, obviously. And, and I noticed today, or was it yesterday, the latest news is that Jimmy Lai has now been arrested in prison for uh, I think it was helping the the 12 who who tried to escape to Taiwan. And uh, if that's an illustration of how things are in Hong Kong, then uh, I guess things are pretty bleak. Um, I, I want to start with you, uh, Ted. We've met several times in Hong Kong. The last time I saw you uh, was uh, just after the, um, uh, the the situation at the Polytech, where yes. there was a demonstration. It was actually the day after the the, the city uh, council elections that went was really it? well. Yeah, it went really well, and there was a demonstration the following day that, uh, where things got a bit um, uh, tense. But there you were again, as you had been many times before, on the front lines with a megaphone standing in between the police and the demonstrators showing that uh, you as uh, as as an elected public official that you were there to protect the the people um, and a lot of things have happened since then that was back in november 2019 uh, you are now for one in in london how do you describe the situation in hong kong as it is right now hong kong situation deteriorated uh, really, really rapidly and beyond everyone's imaginations. And so uh, with the national security law uh, sweeping and all the de de uh, dissidents and activists and politicians and throwing many in jails, uh, even those who are not in jails, they are under detentions because they cannot get bail. So uh, all walks of life are under attack political persecutions, uh, not only politicians and activists, but also the journalists, if you look at Jimmy Lies and other journalists who are being prosecuted, uh, teachers being disqualified, education systems uh, change dr uh, drastically to be a brainwashing uh, tool by the regimes and judicial system changed under the national security law and the, ad the administration stepped in and interfere with court operations uh, as to picking judges to hear political cases and changing the uh, basic principle of common law uh, principles, uh, for example, presumption of justice. So that's why it's very hard to get bailed. 
So my forecast uh, for Hong Kong is that all descents will be cyclic. Uh, in, in in coming years very soon if you look at the massive arrest of the uh, participants in the primary elections uh, among the democrats you can see that uh, not only the radicals not on, only uh, they call the separatists but even uh, for moderate democrats who really truly support one country two systems they are, they won't be tolerated by uh, the regimes uh, as they are as they are dissents themselves. So uh, my forecast is that there won't be uh, strict demonstrations ever allowed, and even there will be uh, general elections uh, th this year. I don't th think at all it will be open and fair, uh, considering quite many of us in jail, quite many of us uh, would be disqualified or would be unseated by uh, whatever judicial or by, the, by decree. So that will be uh, the current situation in Hong Kong, very sadly. Thanks. Um, Mo, you're, you're sitting a bit closer to, to Ted, uh, who's in London right now. You're, you're in Taiwan. What does it look like from, from your perspective? Um, well, yes, I'm in Taiwan. Um, also paying a lot of t attention to Hong Kong. Well, as Ted said, um, Hong Kong situation is getting very, very bad. And um, the deterioration is actually accelerating. Um, what I would like to share is something that the international media might not pay attention to. It's not just about the arrest or the rule of law, but about some other policies that uh, foreign countries would never pay attention to. For example, we have something called um, Leave Home Safe app that is to track uh, where people have been if they want to go out. You know, during COVID-19, many countries do similar things, but with China, we don't, we, we don't trust the government. And um, they've limited people who go out, well, who dine out to two persons. And then the government opens up um, the quota to four persons if you use that app. <laughs> so, um, well, the app itself, we see um, strong surveillance in that. And I think the government is becoming more blatant. It doesn't need to cover up that much. Well, everybody knows what trick the government is playing, but the government only needs to deceive those who still support the government instead of the mass, uh, mass uh, uh, majority of people. Um, so that is um, policy that will become the basis of surveillance, just like in East Turkestan. Um, well, I would say the things that we could still do in Hong Kong, there's not much. Well, you know, there's no street protests. Um, and there will probably no election. What I don't believe the election is going to take place. So um, the government is trying to crack down on the, um, the protests of people who just try to live. <laughs> you know, from everyday life, the government is trying to um, surveil us, to change the culture, like killing our language. So um, I expect Hong Kong to face the dark age very soon. Well, it's going, it's getting darker and darker. Um, I don't like to speak beautiful languages and tell people that it's okay, we can do it. <laughs> um, because I think only realizing the reality, then we know, we will know what to do. And Hong Kong is not looking good at all. Thank you. That's uh, that's very loud and clear. Jo Joey, do you, do you do you share this uh, sense of, um, of of darkness and and pessimism? Yeah, I think I share what Ted and Mo has mentioned because, like, we see that the Chinese Communist Party has been trying to tighten its grip on Hong Kong by continuing the restriction on the people of Hong Kong's very fundamental rights and freedoms. And also with the continuous very unprecedented mass arrest going on in Hong Kong, with the cancellation of the Legislative Council election, the disqualification of democratic 
leaders in Hong Kong, the oppressions on freedom of expression, freedom of speech, freedom of press, and all the attacks on not only the judiciary system in Hong Kong, but also on, for example, the education curriculums in Hong Kong, we see that the this kind of crackdown on Hong Kong's freedom and core values will continue. And I would say the Chinese Communist Party is pretty determined in continuing the suppression on any voices of disobedience in Hong Kong. And as Mo has just mentioned that all these kinds of suppressions and crackdowns are not only done by manipulating the national security law in Hong Kong, but then also by making use, by manipulating all the public health measures, by manipulating the construction and establishment of different public policies. So for example, with the app, that Mo has mentioned, we can see how the Hong Kong government and the Chinese government has been trying to uh, lay the foundation of turning Hong Kong into a surveillance region where they have been trying to build their foundations of establishing a Chinese style social credit system in Hong Kong. So I definitely agree that, I mean, I don't really see the hope of Hong Kong situation getting better in 2021 or 2022. And I think it is a general consensus or assumption by the international community that Hong Kong situation will continue to deteriorate. And I think that is also why it is so important for us, the people who are overseas, who are outside of Hong Kong, to continue our advocacy and to continue to raise awareness from the international society on the Hong, on Hong Kong situation. Thank you very much. Um, I guess we can we can move on to that track uh, in the sense of international attention and, and uh, how this is um, how this is being reported in, in the West and we can start in, in, in Denmark I guess um, um, Thomas I mean you've been following this closely and, and taking a, a very active role in this yourself uh, what does it look like from from Denmark are, are people uh, um, do they do they know about what's happening in Hong Kong is it getting attention? Yes, definitely, and I and I think there's there's two uh, takes on this. Uh, you see, I think uh, all over Europe uh, that the, the the peoples of the nations are becoming more and more concerned about the situation in Hong Kong, and they're more and more concerned about what is happening in in China and and how they are destroying democracy and, and human rights. But on the other hand, you also see the governments who don't dare to do anything because they are afraid of the consequences it can have with trade. And I think that right now uh, we see a, a Britain that is doing something, giving life, lifeboats to Hong Kongers. We are seeing a US that is uh, uh, providing sanctions on, 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 on people in, in, the, in Hong Kong trying to crack, crack down the democracy. But we are also seeing a European Union that is doing absolutely nothing. Uh, I think the only thing they have done is stopping to uh, import uh, tear gas for Hong Kong. That's all they could do. And, and the big problem in Europe right now is uh, the German administration, I think. They are very, very interested in, 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 uh, in trading more with China. Uh, you're also seeing it with the, with the investment deal that the European Union is making with China right now. And I think that if we need to have a shift in, in the European uh, uh, approach to China, we, we will very much need to see that, that we need to have a shift in Germany because they... We can do something in Denmark, we can do something in Sweden, uh, Belgium, and, and so on, but, but we really need to, to turn, uh, turn Germany on this uh, point. And right now, unfortunately, they are thinking more about trade than they are about human rights and uh, the brighter picture uh, in the future. Thank you. Well, that's, that's a nice uh, segue over to, to Trina. Uh, I mean, Norway is also a country that has great interest in, in trading with China. I mean, there are negotiations going on now for a free trade agreement. Um, the well, one thing is what the government is doing, but, but you've been taking uh, part in this through your your role as a parliamentarian and uh, becoming involved through this interparty alliance, uh, um, interparliamentarian alliance on China. Uh, this has been sort of a, a part of the, the way we 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 do things in Norway. We've done that before. We've had various committees in. In our Norwegian Parliament before Tibet um, during apartheid, there was a lot of uh, activism going on. Is there? Are, are, how alone are you and Petter when it comes to uh, finding like-minded people in Norwegian politics to to talk about these things? Uh, because from from where I'm sitting, there's there's not a lot of uh, not a lot of noise coming out of Norwegian uh, politicians when it comes to Hong Kong. 
No, but I, I don't feel very alone in Norwegian politics. I don't do that. I feel that it's strongly supported, uh, even though it's not that high on the agenda in uh, different parties. Uh, as a member of the IPAC, it's, it, it's very uh, inspiring and useful. Uh, and uh, I have to say that this pandemic has really um, interfered our lives. Uh, and it will have changed the world when we come out in the in the end of it. Uh, I hope that it it yeah, Hong Kong won't be a symbol of what all that went wrong during this uh, disease, uh, as uh, as a symbol of how human rights has been weakened. But uh, also IPAC as a structure and the the possibilities to have meetings like the debate we have right now. To, to be seated on the same screen as people all over the world is really strengthen the work among parliamentarians. So, so that's uh, I'm quite optimistic regarding that. I think that will really change the work uh, in the future. But uh, Hong Kong is really depressive development, uh, and uh, and the Chinese uh, position on scale of human rights and uh, how bold they get uh, is is really a development in the wrong direction and uh, i think um, we are now holding our breath regarding burma or myanmar uh, how china will interfere there uh, i i talk to people inside the uh, myanmar saying that this planes that has landed and uh, I told three people in three and get three different versions what these Chinese planes actually uh, contain. So so um, I think that China is high on the agenda. It's high on the agenda for how we discuss politics also in Norway. Uh, it's high on the agenda when our secret police and, the, the, and our um, uh, defense uh, put forward the uh, the challenges for Norwegian security. China is also on that list. So, so I think it's higher on the agenda than we can hear when we talk to journalists. <laughs> so, I, so uh, maybe Peter also agree with me that inside the parliament we dis we discuss China more than we maybe we do outside. But we are very concerned with the development in Hong Kong. It was very disappointing that it actually could go so fast. Uh, in the wrong direction. And I think that uh, Hong Kong is one good argument for not doing a, a trade deal. I'm supporting trade. Uh, I'm not a boycott person either regarding sports and things we're going to discuss later. But, uh, but to make agreements with countries that are not able to held international agreement like they did, did break in, in Hong Kong, I think that's, uh, that's hard right now. Thank you very much. And uh, there was a question for for Petter in, in there. I, I guess we can just uh, leave it at that uh, um, and and pose that question to you. Uh, but I, I also want to add sort of the same question I asked Trina. Do you think that parliamentarians can do more in the situation now than what uh, the Norwegian government can do, or are they willing to do? This is for Trina or me. Okay, so oh, that, that was for you, Petra. So, so first of all, okay, thank you, you very Green, much. Thank you. So, Trina asked uh, if, uh, if can, I, can I just that, move on um, that question uh, one minute because I just want to say a few words to Jessica first. Is that okay? So first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to this very important meeting and to have the opportunity of discussing these things. Uh, Jessica, when we met uh, one and a half year ago at, in my office at the Parliament, we you were not established as a Hong Kong committee in Norway, and but we discussed how. How you could um, how could how you could draw attention to the Hong Kong situation and also how to get influence in Norway and then my advice to you was to establish a Hong Kong committee in Norway and I believe Jessica that has been very very successful. I'm wearing the T-shirt. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, I'm wearing the T-shirt because uh, establishing a Hong Kong committee have given you have given you uh, an access to the Norwegian media, given you access to the Norwegian politicians. And 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 ha and has also given you access to all to the other civil society organizations in Norway because you not only represent yourself 
you represent an organization in Norway. And I think it's very, very vital. Uh, I don't know uh, if, but you should, might, after some years in Norway, be aware that Norway is an extremely organizational and civil society country. You can't do anything without having an organization behind you or being a part of an organization. So you have done exactly the, 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 the right thing. And um, when, when start to say this, I, because I've listened now to all your kind, kind of pessimistic thoughts about Hong Kong. But in my view, um, the, um, and based on also my experience from all my, all my years in Amnesty International, we, I know that, and that, uh, ac that activism through civil society give us some hope and it gives some hope to put pressure on not, not only the Chinese uh, authorities, but also the, the authorities in Hong Kong. And I also believe that the, that the people in Hong Kong, they will be, they will be, um, feel that they receive attention and support from the rest of the world when they know that there's a Hong Kong committee in Norway even discussing their situation. Uh, can you imagine? And that's very, very important for them. They are sitting there in very suppressed and very depressed in, in their situation, but they know that there are Hong Kong committees in small countries uh, on, the, on the other side of the globe that are discussing their situation. And I believe that that, bring, that gives them hope and it also gives them uh, a strength to, to fight. And that's very, very important. And probably the only light in the tunnel right now that there is a global civil society that has a huge engagement on the situation in Hong Kong. And then your question. No, I can take that in next, next uh, in my next yeah, we, we, we can. Uh, we're going to be talking a lot about uh, international pressure and uh, and um, how the the Western uh, or how countries outside Hong Kong how they can work to help out in the situation. So we can we can take that in the next next round, I think. Um, but uh, but it's it's uh, I think it's important what you say, and and maybe I could ask Ted if how that looks from from your perspective. Uh, Petra says that it might encourage people in Hong Kong to know that there are groups in other countries who are thinking about them and working for their case and and cheering them on even though things might seem bleak now at least there are people some people outside hong kong and i guess that also includes you now uh, who are working to improve that situation uh, d does that help the way Peter is uh, suggesting yeah, sorry Good. yes i i totally agree that uh we need to work uh not only uh, on the international level, at, at level of politicians and the political arenas, but also we need to work even harder uh, on the people's level, civil societies, and to establish um, exchanges, connections. And so this is very encouraging. Oh, I'm personally very encouraged uh, doing uh, the protests uh, in 2019 and last year, hearing a lot of uh, Hong Kongers and even non-Hong Kongers outside uh, who are in support of Hong Kong's movement. And we understand that it's not, uh, we are not alone. And that give me uh, uh, the drive of fighting on. And so I also believe that even politicians and even government officials are influenced by the civil society because they are their people, their nationals. So when people, for, for example, in Europe, uh, in North America, uh convinced that uh, for example uh trade should be based on a value oriented approach and then uh the politicians who represent them will listen to them and to balance between the two the national economies uh is more important or the universal value of human rights more important and they have to make the choice so i i think the decisions and the influence is made uh, uh bottom up from the bottoms. So it's more than just solidarity. It's uh, the influence of people. I myself, I, I, I trust uh, the power of people more than I trust the power of politics. So um, that's my sense. I, I just want to remind uh, for, for our viewers, I, I'm sure everybody knows your story, Ted, but I, I just want to remind them that, that you are now in London after having left Hong Kong in, in was it December 1st? Yes. You, you December, 3rd. Yeah. December 3rd, okay. 
Or you, you landed in, you came to Denmark first and then and then to, to London. Uh, yes. And uh, how, how is that new situation like for you, uh, being abroad, uh, being so far away from home and, and trying to, to continue that work uh, from afar? How, how have things changed for you? What, what is it like? Uh, my life changed totally. So since my uh, decisions uh, to be away from home and be in exiles, and so uh, I, I need to uh, thank Thomas here uh, for helping me out of Hong Kong. And I think that uh, international solidarity is, and it's more than that. It's a concrete help. And so uh, that it it's also an example that proves that in some international uh, solidarity. Uh, are, it's so important uh, to the cause of Hong Kong. So my life changed because uh, I, I had to be uh, away from home because I knew that the chance of me uh, being in jail is was quite high uh, two months ago. And so I'm personally not afraid of jails and I do respect people uh, in Hong Kong staying there, even though they, they know they're going to jail. People like Jimmy Lai, uh, they could have gone years ago, uh, flee from, uh, from Hong Kong, but he decided to stay and that's the moral courage. But then I have to, I have to make my choice because uh, when there are not many people in, uh, doing advocacy work internationally for Hong Kong and it's harder and harder for us Hong Kongers to do that from Hong Kong uh, because we will all uh, be thrown to jail after all. So uh, it's I made my choice and I have to uh, be away and speak uh, as the voice of Hong Kong people. And so my, my life changed and so I starting to adopt to uh, the new environment. But then it's also uh, uh, important that I start my uh, advocacy work, meeting parliamentarians and government officials. And here, even with COVID, but on the internet, I, I do meet a lot of people. And so to to tell them well, what the real situation is like in Hong Kong, and how how bad it is, and what 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 kind of uh, help uh, Hong Kong people need from, and also to give them a real picture of uh, uh, when they form a China policy in terms of trade, in terms of uh, other international affairs. So that's my life here in London, basically. Yeah, no, and you're in a country that has uh, that has a government right now that that is taking a great interest in Hong Kong and also uh, pressuring the Chinese government in a very clear and uh, and uh, and loud way. Um, Mo, um, I I think the last time I saw you was the last time I saw Ted at the same demonstration, and uh, I, I know how hard you worked also on the front lines and in organizing and uh, and bringing people together to be at the right place at the right time, and also as as an intermediary between activists and foreign media in, in Hong Kong. Uh, and now you're in Taiwan. Um, I th it seems like the, the relationship between Taiwan and Hong Kong has developed quite a bit uh, over these past years. Uh, the Taiwanese government has become uh, encouraged by, by the development uh, in, in several areas. And also it seems as, as grown closer to the people of Hong Kong. Can, can you sense that from where you are in Taipei, that, uh, that, uh, that the Taiwanese and the, the Hong Kongers are becoming more, uh, are forming more of an, uh, uh, you can call it, I guess, a, 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 a milk tea uh, alliance? <laughs> right. Um, well, in general, people here in Taiwan are supportive of Hong Kongers at a Hong Kong protest. Um, well, you can you can feel that in everyday life, like in people you meet in the streets, in in shops, um, when you talk to them, people seems to understand what is happening to Hong Kong, and show sympathy to us. And also, the Taiwan government is um, well, although Taiwan government is facing strong pressure, but they're still trying to help Hong Kong protesters, um, and. Um, but it's very important to do it secretly, well, for the government side. Um, and as for the Milk Tea Alliance, well, it's very interesting, actually, in Taiwan to meet, um, you know, Thai people, um, Singaporeans, Malaysians, Indonesians, well, you know, South um, Asian protesters. Um, and I think it's very important to point out that the Multi Alliance doesn't exist 
that um, it's not a substantial, you know, <laughs> there's no such alliance. But I, I would rather say it's an online phenomenon that, um, you know, victims of um, totalitarian regimes are paying attention to each other, um, learning from each other, looking at each other's stories through the internet. Um, and, um, well, you won't, you can't imagine how much influence we have to other countries by protesting. Um, well, sometimes we think that's not much that we can do to help Thailand. And there's not much that people in Myanmar, in Singapore, in Malaysia, in Taiwan could do to help Hong Kong. But, um, you know, we are moving people and we do know that there are problems everywhere in the world. Um, just tiny little things that can bring changes. Um, well, Thai people learn from us, um, you know, during, a, uh, uh, during their protest. And, you know, just now when the, um, the change happened in Myanmar, you know, still some people don't want to support Myanmar people, the, the Burmese people like Aung San Suu Kyi, because they accused her for uh, collaborating with China. But I think that's not right. Um, you know, and that is, that is our duty as a protester, as a citizen to understand the context of each country. And just like in Europe, why does Europe um, cherish trade opportunity with China? And what I'm not saying this is correct, but you have to understand each other. Um, and I think that's the foundation of the talk and understanding um, other victims, understanding other totalitarian regimes. Um, that is important in the future of our fights. And who knows, maybe in the future, we will have a gunfight with the government in Hong Kong. And that's so much to learn about um, that Hong Kongers we could never imagine um, if we stayed only in Hong Kong. So I think the multi-alliance, although it's virtual, um, it will be helpful for, for not just Hong Kongers, but also for Thai, for Taiwan, and people not in the multi-alliance, you know, multi is Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Thailand, but for everyone who are victimized. So, um, yeah. You know, I think it's fascinating to see, for example, now the, the demonstrations in Myanmar, how they're picking up um, uh, like post-it notes. They're using them in Myanmar now, uh, uh, for, taken from from the Lenin walls in, in Hong Kong uh, during the, de the demonstrations there. So these movements are learning from each other and, and picking up uh, picking up ways to protest in, in peaceful ways from each other. That's uh, that's fascinating to 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 observe. Um, Joey, I, I wanted to ask you because. Uh, You've been uh, testifying in, in Congress and for the Canadian uh, Parliament, and you're also an, an advisor for, for IPAC. So you've seen, um, you've seen what some of these parliamentarians uh, are asking for in, in the US, Canada, other places, and then you're advising this, this group of, um, of parliamentarians from, from many countries. What can they do to, to make a change as, as a group? What kind of advice are you giving them uh, in concrete terms in, in the way going forward now? I think as an advisor to a, a very large group of parliamentarians from across the globe and also as a student activist myself, I think in the short term it is pretty important for us to continue to encourage the governments to impose coordinated sanctions on targeted individuals from the Chinese Communist Party and also from the Hong Kong government who have been involved in making decisions to violate human rights and also the freedoms of the people of Hong Kong and also of the people in the East Turkestan region, the Tibetans and also the Taiwanese people who are very constantly under military threat from the Chinese Communist regime. And it is very crucial in a short term that they impose sanctions on individuals and also enterprises that violate the previous sanctions or restrictions imposed by different governments. And, and that would be a very crucial step for us to take to 
hold these individuals accountable for the atrocities that they have committed. And also another very urgent demand that we have been asking for is about implementing lifeboat policies for Hong Kongers, because as we see that the Chinese Communist Party continues to make use of the national security law to arrest uh, protesters in Hong Kong, to arrest the, the political figures in Hong Kong. So with the situation deteriorating so rapidly, it is it is essential that we provide a safe harbor and also a lifeline for Hong Kong protesters outside of the city. And that would be the short term goal for, for us. And that would be the, the thing that parliamentarians from across the globe can can do in a short term. But of course, when we talk about like what in the long term that can be done to to protect the people of Hong Kong or to stop the suppression from the Chinese Communist Party, it will always be about a, a, a very long term advocacy and there is no shortcut for us to 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 to, to, to counter the very serious China challenge. And I would say it there has there is a lot to be done to shift the different countries' perspective and also their approach when it comes to tackling China because a lot of us are still with the mindset of that we perhaps we should be approaching China more peacefully and not to trigger China into causing uh, rather radical decisions from the Chinese Communist Party. But then I think that would not be the right strategy for us to take. But then it takes a long time for us to, to really change the mindset and to talk about the long-term strategy when it comes to dealing with China. I think it really takes a lot of prevention and also proactive measures. So for example, when it comes to prevention measures, we know that how serious the infiltration of the MSS has been. We know that the Chinese Communist Party have been adopting to this military civil confusion where they try to steal technologies from different countries where they try to steal the uh, a lot of very advanced technologies and also innovations from other countries. So it is very crucial for us to implement, for example, a foreign agents registration act, for example, the abol abolishment of Confucius Institutes to stop this kind of infiltration into our societies. And then also about proactive measures, which would be, for example, to establish democratic alliances, to consolidate the efforts from different countries, for example, to, uh, to to decrease our market dependency on, on, on the Chinese market by supply chain de decoupling, for example, by shifting our manufacturing bases, for example, by suspending trade agreements, or at least to include human rights conditions in the renewal of trade agreements. And that would be the thing that we expect the international community to be doing in the long term. Thank you. I had a lot of things to write down there. Um, uh, most of that was, was long term, as you said, but um, I picked up at least two, two short term um, points, uh, holding, um, holding people accountable for their crimes against human rights and, um, and providing safe harbor. Um, uh, Thomas, uh, you've been um, uh, important in a process of providing safe harbor for, for one Hong Kong politician, uh, Ted. Uh, how um, how likely is it that the Danish government will provide? I mean, the Danish government didn't even want want to meet Ted when when he uh, arrived in Copenhagen. How likely is the government there to uh, to become a safe harbor for for uh, people fleeing Hong Kong now? I think that um, uh, we are very very far away from that, and uh, and I think that. That what regards Denmark right now, they, they didn't want to meet Ted when, when he was in Denmark. And I also asked the foreign minister uh, not long time ago on, on national service if, if he would change his mind, but he, he unfortunately wouldn't. And I think that, you know, in, in every case, you need to start somewhere. And uh, and when it comes to Denmark, uh, uh, the place of providing safe havens is not the, the place to start. We need to start on a whole other, uh, other and, and much lower level. Uh, and I also think that also to be to be pragmatic that uh, the key function for Denmark should maybe not be providing safe heavens because if you are a Hong Konger, there is places that is more likely to go. Denmark is is another culture, it's another language, so so that's maybe not the most important thing that that we can do in Denmark. I think um, that especially on the trade agreement, uh, we in Denmark have a very big responsibility also because that the trade agreement goes through the European Union and and every nation 
uh, has a possibility to say no. Uh, we have uh, a veto right, uh, and I think that especially with with the, the Swedish who are were very critical to China, I think that the Danes should make a, an alliance and and try to block this uh, trade agreement, because um, I think that you know the Chinese government is not stupid. They they, they, they you know for example look at, at at how right now they are trying to uh, make it very tough for uh, myself and the other people who helped set out uh, trying to put out a rest on us and so on. So other people won't do it. You know, they'll try to make it hard for people to go against their interests. And that's the same thing we need to do in the European Union. We need to make it hard for China to go against European interests. So if we just say to China, okay, uh, you can put the people in the Xinjiang province into jails, you can kill democracy, and you can put uh, all the criticals uh, uh, behind jails or shoot them, uh, then and we will still give you a trade agreement. Then they won't change their behavior. Uh, I think maybe it's time to look at foreign policy like it is a dog. You don't give it a goodie bite if it's done something bad. <laughs> and, 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 and maybe we need to be, uh, uh, I think, a bit more aware about which signals we are sending in the European Union. Because right now, we are just providing them uh, more and more help in establishing and, and developing the regime uh, and and we are actually, I think, a part of uh, of the problem uh, in some somehow. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be a bit unfair to you three, and then since uh, we're talking about the trade agreement here, and uh, it, it's uh, it's a member of your party. She's uh, she's the Minister of Trade in Norway, and she's responsible for the trade agreement with China. Uh, do you do you see a similar development in in Norway where uh, this, uh, or do you agree with that premise that Thomas just said that uh, that engaging in that type of uh, free trade agreement is saying that it's okay what China is doing in in Xinjiang and and Hong Kong? Is there a is there a is there a link between those two? I think it's something wrong with the Norwegian analysis and the European analysis of China saying that if we are kind to them, they are going to be kind to us. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and that was the great wrongdoing by saying okay to the agreement we already have with China with, uh, when we get out of the, the, the pricing zone we have been after the, the, the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, I think that we should be tough. And I think that they would respect us more if we were tough than we do today. And I think that's the, that's the main um, uh, wrongdoing we do in, in, in Europe and in Norway when we are challenging the, the Chinese challenges. Um, like I, I use some examples from, uh, from Myanmar now because it's, it's so close in, in time. But, uh, but I think that the only hope we have for Myanmar not being a, a new arena for the Chinese power is that they actually was there a few days before with their foreign minister uh, and he didn't notice that it was a coup on the way and then he lost face and that's our hope. <laughs> that the Chinese really feel that they, they lost their face they were visiting uh, Myanmar a few days before, so 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 um, I think we should be tougher, and I think we will achieve more uh, with a tougher line and a more open line. I can be personal. I I was minister of sports, and we made an agreement with the Chinese government on the sports cooperation, um, and uh, and I was sitting there in front of the minister of, of sports. And he said, what are you doing in Norway that gave you so many gold medals in the Winter Olympics? And I said, because we are free athletes. Our athletes are free. They decide what they want to do. They, 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 they drive is inside their heart. They, they really want to be a good athletes. We, I'm, I'm as a minister, I don't decide anything. When Marit Bergen go home from this uh, this uh, championship, she will decide herself if she's going to continue as a skier. Um, and free athletes give more gold medals than forced athletes. Um, I think it's important to have occasion to actually say these things. 
and to have uh, have meetings there you can say things like that. and i felt that i was more respected because i was a bit rude than <laughs> if i just was kind and saying you have many good athletes in china because we are actually better in norway in winter sports <laughs> So I felt free to do that. So I think that's um, that's something to learn uh, with how we cooperate uh, with China. I think we get more respect the tougher we get. And just to follow up on that, uh, Trina, I, I have another question for you. But there's one thing I, I keep forgetting to say, and that's uh, if there are viewers out there on YouTube uh, and you have questions, please uh, write them and and uh, and we'll see if we can we can pass them on if if there is time at the end of this discussion. Um, so, uh, so my second question for you, Trina, uh, picking up on, on what Joey said and, and your own point of uh, being tougher, you've been a big proponent of uh, the Bagnitsky laws in Norway and, uh, and having laws that will hold individuals accountable for, for human rights abuses. Now Norway will probably, uh, well, the, the government has, has uh, given the green light for a Bagnitsky law in Norway and uh, it looks like Parliament might uh, might also do so later this year. Do you, do you think that will be just a piece of paper, or do you think Norway will actually use this law to try to punish uh, individuals who have been uh, abusing human rights around the world? Uh, I think the key here is the European Union. We are going to do the same as the European Union do. Uh, and the European Union adopting this law also make the opportunity to, to do that in Norway. Uh, I had to admit the first time I put this suggestion forward in the parliament and uh, the green and red the government really said no way. Um, I, I, I thought this is not going to, to ever be the law in Norway. So I'm really happy. I'm, um, I'm responsible for that uh, law in my committee and I said this is going to be my last law. Uh, <laughs> as a member of the parliament, and, it's, and I really wanted that that issue to to bring it into the debate in the in the parliament, and I think it's important. But I think we are we are very uh, coward to do things alone, uh, and uh, uh, I have to admit that uh, uh, I have never supported Norwegian membership in the EU. But their the relationship to China, I think it's an argument for Norwegian membership in the EU because we are getting so coward when we are alone. <laughs> so uh, we should uh, should learn more about that. I think. Stronger together. Uh, Petra, I have a question uh, for you. But first, uh, Mo, I think you, you had uh, something you wanted to say about Magnitsky laws. Um, yes, thank you, Christoph. Um, well, I'm in contact with um, MEPs and other MPs from other countries regarding, well, yes, uh, we were talking about the Magnitsky law as well, among other topics. And um, I think it's the MEPs, well, uh, European countries tried to make it a uh, two-thirds majority to, to, um, to sanction, to, 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 to make the sanction list and to sanction well, whoever they think need to be sanctioned. But um, apparently some countries vetoed, and we know who they are. Uh, Hungary, um, Greece, well, maybe Malta, I, I, I don't know the list. And, um, and we expect difficulties um, in the future when the, san the real sanction comes up. Um, and, but we're still trying to do something. And that's why um, we, I am also in contact with MPs from other countries like the Netherlands. Uh, Sweden, and we've been discussing um, multinational sanctions, Magnitsky sanctions, if the um, EU sanction doesn't pass or it comes up uh, not as um, the way as we want it. Um, and of course, I see the necessity to do it in solidarity. If there is EU, then of course we do it with, within the EU. But we also know that China has infiltrated the EU, you know, those countries. Um, so um, I think there is a pos possibility that uh, like-minded countries could do it together, even if that's not in the EU. And especially Norway is not in the EU. So I think um, 
maybe you can also consider um, if you think it's possible, if you think you want to do it, um, well, you can also talk to other countries. And of course, we can also line up uh, um, those countries who think it's important because the more the merrier. If you do it only with 10 countries, then of course, you will face retaliation from China. But if you do it with 20 countries or all the countries but Greece and Hungary, then I think the image is quite uh, uh, um, uh, obvious what is happening in the EU. So I think that's something that you can consider. Thank you, Mo. <laughs> um, Petr, I'm, I'm not sure what uh, what you um, or, or your party would think about this idea of joining the EU for the sake of uh, of uh, human rights in uh, in Hong Kong or other places. But I, I know that um, um, first of all, I mean, you're uh, engaged or you're in your activism for human rights in China goes back a long way. Uh, I remember meeting you in Beijing in 2006 or so when you were uh, head of Amnesty and uh, took part in the Norwegian-Chinese Human Rights Dialogue. Um, how, uh, that seems like a very long time ago now. And also, I remember the photos of you from outside the Norwegian parliament with a yellow t-shirt uh, that, that said in Chinese characters, uh, freedom. Now, what are the concrete things that you've suggested has been to uh, to to cancel the the deal Norway uh, mm. went in uh, uh, the the deal between Norway and China in December 2016, the well, the deal that took Norway out of the icebox with with China, where among other things it says in point three that uh, Norway shouldn't do anything to harm the bilateral relationship to China, which in effect means that Norway really can't do anything uh, to to uh, to annoy China without being in breach of that agreement. Why do you think uh, the government should cancel that? And uh, what effect do you think that might have? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Christopher. Uh, I think there, there, um, there are many things actually you know, we can do to be a part of the international pressure towards uh, changing the uh, human rights situation in China and then, and then also in Hong Kong. And, um, and uh, the, uh, the discussion on the, uh, on the so-called normalization agreement is uh, is definitely uh, definitely one of them. Uh, I believe that uh, that particular agreement uh, should be cancelled because it denies Norway to uh, put forward a straight a straightforward and tough uh, a human rights critique towards China. Basically, that's the that's the key point. The um, the uh, the agreement. It's not a kind of a formal agreement, but it's agreement that in a way invites Norway into the. Uh, into the uh, political room and also uh, with, with China keeps keeps up some dialogues with the Chinese, but it definitely prevents the Norwegian authorities to be tough. As I totally agree with you, we should be. It prevents us from being tough and direct on human rights critique. That's why we should terminate it. Um, secondly, I think we are uh, Norway is now entering the Security Council. And we have a very important uh, we have a very important role to play there. I think the um, discussing the, uh, the the China the China situation, it's quite fundamental that Norway the Norwegian diplomats are able to act independently. Without acting acting independently in the Security Council, um, they will be very very weak towards the pressure both from China and US and also EU. So we need to have kind of a the need to be support from the Norwegian parliament and also from the Norwegian government that the diplomats in the Security Council should act independently. They should not be some kind of sitting there and trading here and there and negotiating between and, and discussing what the, uh, what the superpowers are saying. Act independently. That's my second point. My third point is that um, we should be able to uh, have a confrontative and tough uh, human rights critique towards China, even if it has economic consequences. That's a key thing. You have to admit that it might have economic consequences if we are able to say straightforward that we do not accept the uh, human rights violation taking place in China and in Hong Kong. Saying that straightforward, it might have um, some, some economic consequences. Okay, then we have to take that. We have to take those economic consequences. If we all the time 
uh, are saying that we don't dare say anything towards China because we are afraid of these economic consequences, then the idea of being tough will be something we will lose um, before we start. We will not be able to take that those those uh, tough positions without accepting that we also might lose some money. So having a human rights, sticking up the human rights values are more important than sales of salmon, I would, I would say. My fourth point is that um, on the forthcoming, um, we don't really know actually the, uh, the plans for the free trade agreement. I, te- I, I checked it today. We don't know, um, perhaps Trina knows more, but the Minister of Foreign Affairs, they have not come to the parliament yet with any signals on, on, on when they should have this uh, agreement. And we do not really know about the, the content. Uh, so we have not been discussed within my party yet, the uh, agreement. Uh, but if you ask me, I would mean the same, that uh, such agreement is not wise. If we want to have a tough human rights dialogue with China, we should not sign a trade agreement with China. Because then a trade agreement with China will make us more um, dependent economically. And the more dependent economically we will be with China, the less capable we will be to have human rights critique towards China. Um, And we can also ask whether it's necessary. I mean, the Norwegian trade with China is quite good at the moment. It's it's improving. So why should we have a free trade agreement with China? If it has, uh, and I I believe that a free trade agreement with China will have kind of bad political consequences. So um, my advice to my own party is that we say no to the to the um, trade agreement then they might come up with saying that well look at this free trade agreement we can have a lot of conditions here we can have conditions on on uh, on the workers right on human rights on blah 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 rights those conditions are also in the trade agreement between efta and china and we have seen that china are violating those conditions all the time so um if we if the Norwegian parliament will accept the trade agreement based on conditions on human rights in the agreement, I will say uh, that will be some kind of a false promises from China. They will not respect those. Uh, I, haven't, we haven't, I have no kind of belief that they will respect those kind of conditions if, they sign, if we sign up a uh, free trade uh, agreement. So these are, are my four points for the Norwegian government to do. Act independently, um, terminate the uh, normalization agreement, say also no to the free trade agreement. And uh, if we do that, we might lose some money, but that's okay. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> it was it was interesting uh, to see that there's a, a TV series on, um, on Norwegian TV these days about the, the royal couple, the king and the queen, and their, uh, their travels abroad. Uh, and one episode was about their trip to China in 1997, yes. where um, the then foreign minister, Knut Wallbeck, he had just gotten the job the day before the, the trip. And uh, he had gotten a very clear note from his boss, the, uh, the, the prime minister, to, to say exactly what you said here, Petter, that uh, some things are more important than, uh, than getting a trade agreement or getting uh, some more money into the, into the national bank account. So the foreign minister went out and he said very clearly at a press conference before he left that uh, priority number one for Norway would be human rights and priority number two would be business. And uh, unfortunately, that, uh, that sense of, uh, of idealism didn't last. Uh, it didn't even last throughout that trip. It was, it was, it was uh, shot down very quickly. Wasn't that a perfect government? <laughs> parties in the center. <laughs> well, I guess I guess you'll have to see what happens after the election in September. <laughs> now, um, I can I can answer answer. I I I totally agree with Pet regarding this um, this agreement we have with China. But it was only the the Socialist Left Party and the Liberal Party that was not supporting it in the in the parliament. Um, uh, I I see that maybe one of the things we learned during this uh, uh, pandemic is is that we are too depending on China regarding trade. And I think we will see that in many areas. Uh, I I was a member of government when China asked us to to have face masks from us. Uh, And then uh, Arna asked, who is making the face mask we have in Norway right now? 
And then, then the, the Minister of Health said, that's China. And then we said, we won't send face masks to China uh, because they actually make the face mask we need when this disease comes to Norway. So, so, so I think we learned a lot regarding production of uh, medicine and production of, uh, of many uh, vital things in our trade uh, from China. And I think that will, will be different when we come out of this uh, disease. Um, I'm not always against a, a trade agreement. Uh, that depends on the trade agreement. Uh, but um, I think that uh, we need to be strong regarding human rights for China, well, unless we can just have the trade uh, as we have today, because we're trading a lot. It's just around the corner. Live streaming. No, it's been, it's been uh, just around the corner for about uh, 12, 13 years now. Um, so we're, I guess we're still waiting. Now, Ted, I, I wanted to ask you about a couple of points that have been um, uh, that we've heard here. Uh, and one is about the importance of, of uh, international alliances, and the other one is the, the question of uh, of the EU and the EU's reluctance to to uh, to be tough on China, the way Thomas uh, described earlier. Now, uh, when we see the way that the UK is acting now, the way the US is acting. Uh, it looks like Biden will continue much of uh, the China uh, policy that Trump uh, began, maybe mm -hmm. with less bluster and um, and more diplomacy, uh, but certainly more engagement and uh, a greater interest in, in pulling in old uh, allies, especially in Europe. So when you see this uh, reluctance from the EU to engage the way the, the US and to a large extent the UK would want them to, how how can you um, how do you see that developing, and, and what part can you play in that to to try to help convince the EU to to join this uh, alliance of uh, democracies? Yes, you're right. That's also my observation, my feelings. Uh, as uh, for the past two months, as I talked to a lot of uh, MEPs uh, and also uh, researchers uh, and uh, uh, scholars uh, among EU. And my, my feeling is that uh, they are quite reluctant uh, to be to take a more uh, or less reliant uh, approach economically towards China. So uh, the comprehensive uh, agreement on investments uh, that is to be signed in a year or two uh, between the EU and, and China and, and rectifications uh, is really, really alarming and because now that uh, it is undeniable and uh, we all can see human rights violations uh, in, in Hong Kong and also in the Uyghur uh, genocide. When, and it's very hard for me personally and to quite many Hong Kongers to accept that uh, the world or at least the West is dealing with uh, Beijing uh, like business as usual. Like, uh, of course, those Parliamentarians would tell me that oh, uh, they call that uh, the CAI uh, agreement uh, normalizations, like the term that we had it with uh, with Norway. But they they also claim that it's leverage because uh, once you engage China into trade, and that's where you you can monitor and uh, impose pressure on China. But then I the question that I put to them is that whether it's a real leverage or it's an endorsement uh, that uh, Beijing and China is a trustworthy nation that you can have trade with. Considering that if you look back at the CIA trade agreement, it's, it's written in the preamble that the parties, the parties uh, reaffirms uh, the basic values uh, of, what's written in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And it's also written in the text of the CIA that China has to impose uh, policies and regulate in their territories to promote social uh, morals and justice and betterment of the peoples. When, when the West and when, when EU countries knows very well that it's not the case, that's not what's happening in China and but then going into the same trade uh, trade agreements uh, as if th those clauses are nothing, uh, it, it's very hard for me to accept. It's not leverage. It, it's it's an endorsement. So my approach is that um, 
uh, I, I'm personally for a more a boycott and an isolate approach uh, towards China and less uh, economic reliance on, on trade with China because uh, in the long term, uh, it's, uh, it's significant uh, as a gesture that uh, free worlds are joining hands together and to put on a, a boycott approach and in recognitions of the of the freedom values, but uh, economically, practically, it also hit China economically because uh, in long term, China has to rethink whether they can have any benefits by uh, imposing a tougher approach towards the world, and whether but now the China the Chinese leader are talking about an inner economic uh, circles among themselves. That means that uh, in the long term, they know uh, it's hard to make any profits and they, they know that uh, the tougher approach is go not going to work on free world leaders, on free worlds. It will in terms uh, slowly uh, change its strategies on, on human rights situations. Uh, and so I, I, be I believe that, so that's why sanctions so the case, my, my least case style sanctions is, is important, light bolts are important, and these are boycott and isolation approach towards China. And I think that's the way it's supposed to be. Uh, Thomas, uh, you're, you're the closest to, uh, to Europe here being uh, in the EU. Um, what do you think about what Ted uh, just said? Uh, and, and do you also believe that, uh, that boycott is a good uh, approach that, uh, that might have, uh, have a concrete effect? Yes, I, I think so. If, if you look at the investment deal with, with, with China, it's pretty interesting because the way it's formulated, saying that, uh, for example, on, on, on workers' rights, it's saying that whenever China is, is in the position where it's possible for them, then they should uh, uh, go into uh, all these uh, things on worker rights. And, and, and the way it's, it's formulated is just a diplomatic language for bullshit. This is never going to happen. Uh, it's the same uh, formulations that the EU are using on uh, a, a trade of weapons with China, where they're also saying, yeah, we will work to uh, ensure a, a situation at some point where we can trade weapons with China. And of course, they're never going to trade weapons with China. So so, so I think uh, uh, talking about that, for example, as the Danish foreign minister does, that this uh, investment deal can also improve the uh, human rights situation in uh, in China that is uh, that is nonsense and and i think that that what we should do is actually to say a very hard no to the this investment deal and doing it with very clear reasons saying that the situation in hong kong the situation in xinjiang the situation in tibet with that going on we cannot make a investment deal with you uh, and and then i think that that what uh, what the world needs most now is a biden administration working together with the European Union, uh, Japan, India, so on, to actually try to set up uh, some uh, some some things on on how China is treating and cheating on trade and so on, and say that if they continue to do this, it will be answered with tariffs because I think that that money is the best language that they understand in Beijing. Joey, what's uh, what's your take on that? Do you think a carrot or a stick? And and also, do you think boycott is uh... That's a good way forward. I think boycotting China is a necessary thing that we all, all the countries in the free world should be doing because given that we are now so heavily reliant and dependent on the very gigantic Chinese market and also given that we have been relying on China on so many ways, it is very crucial for us to alter our approach when it comes to dealing with China and also to decrease our independence in not only in trade, but then also in the other aspects on the Chinese market so that we could encourage the other countries. I mean, the, the rather smaller countries with a weaker wealth, with a, with a weaker power to also join the fight and to stand up against China. And that is very crucial for us to not only do it by issuing very strong statements with very uh, strong vocabularies and words, but then also to really take actions to uh, to isolate China economically, for example, for example, to boycott and to object to the ratification of the EU-China deal, for example, to uh, 
to to no longer to renew the trade agreements with China and also to uh, shift our manufacturing bases from China into and to bring them back to our own countries. And I think that is a necessary way forward to really isolate China because words are never going to work when it comes to making China, making China change or to force a democratic development inside of China. And the only way to do that is to economically isolate the country and to really force the change from the, uh, from the Chinese Communist regime. So I think that is a necessary thing that all the countries in the free world should be doing. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at the time here and I see that it's running out very quickly. We're not even uh, halfway through my list of questions, unfortunately, so we'll have to do this again soon. Um, I, uh, I figure we can, we can sort of leave the floor open for a couple of minutes uh, uh, for some concluding remarks. Uh, and I know, Petra, you have to leave very soon, so maybe you can, uh, you can start us off. Yes, thank you very much. I just want to have a, one quick comment on the kind of a boycott thing. I, I believe that's uh, impossible. It is not wise. China is the world, well, the world's second largest economy. It will be the largest. And, um, and uh, we, it will be impossible to unite the countries throughout the world to, to for an economic boycott on China. I don't think it's wise either. I mean, if we have <clears throat> that kind of economic isolation of countries to, to believe that that will actually force the countries to change the human rights policies. Uh, that's been tried for uh, against uh, the North Korea discussions of doing that in, within Israel. It was tried in also in uh, in South Africa during the apartheid time, <clears throat> but we saw the um, we saw when the world acted like that. We saw the um, more the opposite happened actually because we saw that when the these countries that felt that they were isolated, they were even tougher on the uh, on their minorities and on the on the uh, on the uh, political opposition in the countries. So I believe we need to keep an open dialogue with China and also on the human rights situation, but it should be a tough one, as, as I said previously. Okay, I will leave in two minutes. So I will just uh, use those two minutes to say thank you very much and particularly thank you to Jessica and her, and, and her colleagues. I believe that what you are doing, building up a civil society, building up, up a community in Norway, is extremely important. <clears throat> it's very difficult to change the situation in China, but I believe that when we look at the how we can um, the contribution from the civil society, that gives me hope, and I think that's at the moment the only hope we have. So, uh, so uh, keep on your struggle, Jessica, and congratulations with the with the committee that you have have established. You have so far been very very successful, and thank you very much. I have to leave now. Bye bye. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, Mo, I believe your your hand was uh, was up. <laughs> yes. Um, I very much wanted to to comment on the CAI and FTA with China. Um, I think uh, Peter was right by saying um, that um, you should take those economic consequences if necessary. Um, I mean, what Ted also mentioned that um, well, many EU members will tell us that uh, signing the CAI with China it would become an leverage and so that they can monitor and put more pressure on China. But I mean, well, I don't believe that because um, look at China, uh, sorry, look at Hong Kong, look at East Turkestan. Do you think the situation is improving? What if you think the uh, signing the agreement will make a change? Then why not now? Why not appoint the signature? If you can't even make a change now, what makes you believe that you're going to make changes in the future. Um, I mean, China is very famous for violating uh, agreements <laughs> and everybody knows that. Um, one example, you should make sure that China drops, lifts the national security law, for example. And that will be the condition that you can sign the agreement with China, or you can also focus on the Uyghurs or others. But I mean, uh, what we see now is that Europe will not bear any um, consequences and Europe very much wants to sign the agreement with China no matter what. <laughs> um, what is, this is my closing remark. I would like to tell you a very um, wonderful story that we hear from childhood. 
um, so one day we go into the shop, we see a pair of jeans or dress, and that marks 100 um, renminbi. And sorry, um, yes, so we go in and we show the shopkeeper or the boss that we love this dress. You show your mom, oh my God, this is so beautiful. You know what signal you're sending to the shop? You are sending the shop that no matter how much it is, you will buy it. <laughs> so what we do normally, that's in our education. So you go into a shop, you look around, you don't show which piece you love the most. <laughs> and that's how you can bargain. Because otherwise, it's you that will sacrifice the dress that you love so much. And in the trade with China, I see it now is that China knows very that uh, Europe will sign the agreement no matter what. And in this game, Europe lost already. Um, so that is why China will not sacrifice, well, will not compromise. And that's why Europe is compromising. And I think it's the same that we can apply to Norway, to normalization, because you want to sa sell salmon and oil. And you can sacrifice your human rights. You can sacrifice your freedom of speech. And that is why you are submitting yourself to China. Um, I think um, I would recommend Europe, as I say also to Taiwanese, that, you know, um, very often Taiwanese people ask us how Taiwan can help. I said, it's very simple. Stay strong, stay independent from China. And that in that way, um, when we need help, you'll be able to help us. So I think that we should also apply to Norway and Europe, to the United States, to the UK, to Australia. Um, right, so that's my final remark. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Mo. It's, it's an interesting uh, dirty little secret about that uh, normalization deal with, uh, with China, is that everyone thinks that the, the Norwegian businesses that exports to China went down during those six years uh, in the freezer. That didn't happen. Exports went up. Uh, they almost doubled from 2010 to 2016. So the boycott from China was political and diplomatic. It wasn't. Uh, it didn't affect businesses to the to the extent that the Norwegian businesses would uh, would uh, often claim that they did. Um, I, I think Joey, that your your hand is up. Yeah, I just have a few few points to make because like when we're talking about boycotting China or uh, an isolation policy when it comes to uh, stopping or countering the very aggressive China expansion, it is not only, I mean, it is not, it is definitely not about cutting all the connections or stopping interactions or communications with the Chinese people or to stop every kind of cultural exchange or interactions, but uh, it is about to gradually decrease our market dependency on China. It is, I mean, it is impossible for us to cut down all the trade and also all the business ties with China immediately or at once. But then we all have to realize that it is that our very heavy reliance on China that is stopping us or that is hindering the countries from standing up against China. So I would say instead of using the word boycott, I think it, it would be more accurate that we that we formulate a strategy to decrease the market dependency on China. And I think that is a very significant and crucial step for all the free world countries to make. And perhaps I'll also include my concluding remarks right now. And that is, as I have just said, solidarity is a very, very important element when it comes to countering China. And that is not only about the solidarity between Hong Kongers, Taiwanese, Uyghurs, Tibetans, but then also about the solidarity between the Western society, the Eastern society, and also all the countries in the free world, because it is impossible for any single country to stand up against China alone. It cannot be done simply by the United States. It cannot be done simply by the UK, but then it really requires the joint and coordinated effort from all the countries around the globe. But then for now, a lot of our Hong Kong international advocacy efforts or attention have been focused very heavily on policies in Canada, in UK and in the US. So I would really like to say thank you to Jessica and also her amazing colleagues for arranging this panel and also for establishing this committee because it is very crucial for us to also pay attention and to 
try our best to raise the public awareness and also to work on the policy efficacies in also the European or the other Asian countries. And that would be a, a very significant for us to, to, to bear in mind. So yeah, thank you all for participating in this. And this has been a really constructive conversation and I really appreciate all your efforts. All right, thank you very much. Um, since we're, we're rounding up here, but I, I have a concrete question for you, Ted, from uh, from Arna from the Hong Kong Committee in Norway. Uh, uh, what do you think about establishing, and I guess you can incorporate this into your, your final remarks, but what do you think about establishing a Hong Kong parliament in exile? Uh, I guess there are quite a few of you who are in exile now. Uh, would that be a way to organize? I think you're muted. In the long term, I'm open to that. But for the moment, uh, I think we don't have uh, enough people uh, fleeing uh, or already in exiles uh, who can be uh, at, at compositions uh, of that uh, parliament. That's that's the worrying point. So uh, I think for the moment, it's best that we, we, we focus on international advocacy work and then uh, to build up allies uh, amongst the political arena in the world and also uh, like uh, like in this forum in, in, uh, on civil society levels and I, I i think after it's only after we have strengthened ourselves uh with, with both levels and then we can have the conditions uh be mature enough to talk about a, a shadow parliament and that would be a constructive and that would also have legitimacy so enough uh, also uh, from, and that's my, my thought basically. And, and yes, as a, as a final remark. And so uh, I also thank Jessica and the, and the uh, Hong Kong committee for uh, not only organizing this and, but receiving us uh, last year and connecting us to a lot of our international friends like like Thomas we met last time and so that I, I hope we, it will continue it can continue and it will continue to be my drive and quite many people's drive to fight for freedom for Hong Kong and freedom in the world so thank you so much all right thank you thank you Ted and uh, good to see you again um, Thomas, um, I mean, you've uh, you've uh, got yourself into some trouble with uh, with your actions last December, bringing Ted to to Denmark. Um, what are you and your organization going to do now to to keep uh, to, to keep uh, fighting for 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 rights for both? I mean, it's broader than Hong Kong. It's uh, it's on China. What what's your next steps? Yeah, that uh, that's right. Uh, the, the, the situation about. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so trouble is, is is developing right now actually uh, and uh, and it's it's going to be to be interesting what what the hong kong regime is actually going to to do um on 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 our uh, uh, work right now uh, i think that that we are um, we're really working hard on the hong kong case but the, the next thing that is that is going to be our priority is uh, is um, the possible genocide in the Xinjiang province where we are uh, trying to make a coalition asking the Danish government to uh, uh, not say that there is a genocide, but to say that they uh, will work uh, in an international coalition to provide the necessary uh, evidence to uh, take this case to court. Uh, so I think that will be uh, one of our, our next move in, uh, in Denmark. Uh, and I think that, 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 that when we discuss Hong Kong and, and the Xinjiang province, all these things are working together because uh, they are a response of also the power that the international society have been giving to uh, uh, the, the the Beijing uh, regime, and uh, and and we need to challenge them on their power uh, if we want to make sure that the situation in Hong Kong and Xinjiang and all over China will become uh, better at, at any time. So uh, so the next step for us is is, is to talk more about genocide. All right, thank you very much, um, Trina. Um, some of your uh, prominent party uh, fellow party members from the from the Liberal Party uh, have nominated uh, Hong Kong Free Press for the Nobel Peace Prize, and we know what happened last time. Uh, um, someone who was not in the uh, good favors of the Chinese government received a Nobel Peace Prize. Do you think that would be um, uh, be a, a good way to to bring um, bring the fight forward? 
Yes, and the Nobel Peace Prize Committee is totally free and disconnected from the Norwegian Parliament, even though we have the opportunity to nominate. So, so um, uh, we no uh, we nominate uh, them because we think that will be a great prize and a great focus on human rights in the in the, in the right way. Uh, and um, uh, when we are discussing boycott or not boycott, uh, I understand the. Uh, the ideas, but uh, but I um, even though if China was a very small country with a small economy, I I would, wouldn't have believed in that way of working uh, with political issues. And and even though I really loved that the uh, uh, next Winter Olympics should be in Oslo, because that was the right place to have it. <laughs> and I think. Uh, um, I think it was bad of Norway not to fulfill the, their goals to have it in Oslo. Uh, so so um, I think we should be there and we should tell everyone what we mean and we should have a strong opinion on every arena we have. Um, and the only positive development I've seen with China the last uh, six months is that they actually supported the the suggestion regarding uh, Myanmar that Norway and France created in the Security Council. They didn't veto it, they supported it. And that uh, that was um, was interesting. And it was interesting development. Um, uh, all the other news has been bad news on this area until then. Um, so um, we have to be strong, but I, I I have to say thank you so much for all the people that stand in this fight and all the people that sacrifice that much for human rights. It's, it's so vital for all of us that live in democracies uh, to know that people really sacrifice that much uh, for these values that are so important. And uh, thank you so much for telling us because we can't do the work if people don't tell if people don't tell their story and tell their experiences and and what they see and what they hear, it's uh, it's so crucial for the for the for the fight. And I, I have to admit that I feel that the democracies are losing right now, even though the election in America was a a, a, a right direction for the development. But I. I think all the democracies should stay together and put together and work together to to support democracy and human rights all over the world. And um, and uh, we have felt so many years that the development was in the right direction. Right now, I don't feel that. Uh, and it's so important that people stand in the fight. So I'm really, from my heart, very grateful for the work you do. So And thank you for the opportunity to be here. It's it's inspiring to see the fight people are are standing. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, uh, Trina. And um, uh, we're way over time, but I I, I feel that uh, this discussion has uh, has opened for for that uh, to happen. It's been it's been very very uh, interesting to hear all of you. Uh, what a fantastic panel this is, and uh, and it's um, it's it's good to hear all your perspectives. I just remember that when I said to Mo and, and Ted that the last time we saw each other was in, in uh, November 2019, that's not true because we saw each other in Oslo around, about a year ago. There was a photo exhibition in, uh, in, in Oslo in February last year. Um, that also feels like a very long time ago. But uh, thank you again to, to all of you and thank you to Jessica for, for uh, setting uh, this up, to the Hong Kong Committee for, for doing the important work you do. And uh, hopefully we can we can all meet uh, again under under better circumstances, maybe in person and maybe in a in a brighter future. Thank you very much. Thank you.